Hi, welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, the title for this uh, this conversation is Building a BRICS Consensus on Counterterrorism. As uh, we are all aware that terrorism is a, is a very complex uh, challenge uh, that, that the international community faces. And it is not something that individual states can mitigate or deal with uh, only on their own level. We need a wider framework, a wider mechanism uh, between governments and, uh, and various entities to be able to deal with the kind of challenges and threats uh, that this uh, poses. BRICS nations can cooperate uh, to counter terrorism and promote international peace and security, and that's something that BRICS nations have been working towards. Uh, in this particular session, uh, we have representatives from all the five BRICS countries, and we are going to discuss how we can cooperate on issues of terrorist financing in particular, the use of internet for terrorist purposes, and countering radicalization. These are the issues that we're going to focus on specifically, but we will talk about uh, uh, the larger issue of terrorism and how uh, intergovernmental mechanisms can deal with them. Let me introduce very quickly to our panelists for today. We have Professor Ana Cruz, Professor at Brazilian College of Intelligence, uh, joining us from Brazil. We have uh, Dr. Timo Fey Bordashev, Academic Supervisor of the Center for Comprehensive European and International Studies at the National Research University of a Higher School of Economics, also Program Director of uh, the Valde Discussion Club with us from Russia. We have Dr. Shen Yi, Director of Center for BRIC Studies, FDDI, Fudan University, China. Professor Nirmala Gopal, Department of Criminology and Forensic Studies at the University of Kawazulu Natal, South Africa. Professor Shiram Cholia, Professor and Dean at the Jindal School of International Affairs, India. And I'm your host today, moderator, Palki Sharma Upadhyay. I'm the executive editor of Beyond, and I'm very happy to host this conversation. Uh, we will start with uh, uh, with opening remarks, uh, let me go straight to, we will follow the order, BRICS is, is uh, what we are following, so we'll start with Brazil. Professor Ana Cruz, let's begin with you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, good morning for those who are in the morning, good evening for those who are not. I was invited to join you in this session and try to highlight some aspects about counterterrorism that may receive convergent attention of the five BRICS countries. I'm Anna Cruz, and I've been studying terrorism for the last three years, and eventually I collaborate with the Brazilian School of Intelligence in this specific team. Today is certainly a great opportunity to learn with you all. Fortunately, Brazil is not a main target of international terrorism. Lone wolves and low-cost, low-impact attacks are considered the most probable threat, as there are no registry of operational cells implanted here. Even having this long tradition being a peaceful and diverse country, Brazilian Academy is interested in studying strategies for preventing radicalization and extremist violence, and also focusing in interpreting legal instruments concerned with counterterrorism, which are all very new in Brazil. The National Law 13260, defining terrorism, came into the political arena only in 2016. And even more recently, in 2019, we had the law number 13810, fighting terrorism financing and enforcing immediately United Nations Security Council sanctions. There is only a handful of cases and condemnations for the Brazilian Academy to follow and to discuss. So it's crystal clear that there is much to learn with experiences abroad and the international academic efforts are fundamental. It's well known that cooperation is crucial for combating the terrorist threat. The security forces need to exchange information, the diplomacy assemble high-level meetings, but there is also a room, and a very important one, for building capacities in the academic scope. Faculties, researchers, students are open to the vanguard, are free to dissent, and what's the aim here, are also free to raise theoretical common bases independently of governments. Brazil still confronts novelties 
that the academic can help to address. The radicalization in prisons, the misuse of the internet, the return of foreign fighters, the implementation of sanctions, the impacts of national designations, the financing of terrorism. They are all issues with almost no practical previous experiences in Brazil. So if the scholars set up a corpus of knowledge, collecting evidences, pointing sources of reference, and reaching conclusions, it will certainly be of extremely useful contribution, even non-Biden, we know, but essential for the official counter-terrorism agenda. Brazil is building capacities in preventing and responding terrorism in a, we can say, a comfortable position because it's a, a country that did not record any victims of terrorism in its territory. But it does, does not mean that Brazil has no interest or commitments in this area. Not at all. We all know, we are aware that here in the BRICS sphere, we have very important ones. But in face of the Brazilian reality, the national scholars can, as I've already said, represent an engaged community, able to design the understanding of the phenomenon and the future of policies. That's what I had to, to say in this opening remarks. Thank you, guys. Very well received. Uh, let's now move to Dr. Timofey Bordyshev for his uh, opening comments. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It's a big pleasure to join you today uh, for this video conference uh, and for this session devoted to, to the topic, which is both uniting and dividing any international institution and any multilateral cooperation. So at first, it should be said that uh, the first pandemic year of the international politics has not been very supportive for the international institutions, and BRICS Group is not being has not been excluded from the main trends. Basically, all international institutions and the multilateral formats have been suffering from the rise of the national agendas promoted by the governments at the expense of international cooperation. Even though strong and traditional reading of this term institutions suffered most, like Europe, for example, European Union, big ambitions create bigger disappointments. However, one cannot say that even more flexible formats also did not experience difficulties. But in this respect, the BRICS group has shown itself to be relatively successful. So to start with that, it must be said that in defining any sort of strategy for any multilateral grouping, as well as for the state, the main task is always to find a common or at least shared understanding of what threat this strategy should respond and what shared interests it might reflect. Like any issue related to national security, the fight against terrorism is one of the most difficult areas for international cooperation. States, of course, are willing with the big difficulties to share confidential information among themselves in matters that may have an immediate effect on the safety of the citizens. Well, in addition, different countries have different priorities related to several aspects. First, these are general power capabilities and claims of any state, among them the BRICS countries, of course, to participate in solving global and regional issues. Secondly, these are the priorities related to the internal order and the activities of the extremist groups on a religious or ethnic basis. And especially in the case of BRICS, where the countries do represent a different part of this, of this earth, of course the countries have their own very deeply rooted national priorities. Third, there are obligations and interests associated with the third parties. Some member states of the BRICS cooperate closer with the third countries or the leading world superpowers. Some of the BRICS states have a hostility as a main defining factor of relationships with, for example, the United States or their European allies. So this issue, in my view, is especially sensitive when it comes to mutual trust, whilst we speak about the cooperation in such a sensitive area. 
Well, there are different priorities for individual countries and regions that are especially sensitive from the point of view of terrorism. For example, we see that in the case of Afghanistan, individual BRICS member states adhere to different approaches to the possibility of a dialogue with the political part of the Taliban movement. Finally, we also face a more fundamental problem. Now all international institutions are experiencing problems because there is no answer to the question of leadership. Brinks has an advantage in this regard. There is not and cannot be one leader within Brinks. But this does not solve the problem of whether institutions have a right to life at all. In this respect, we often rightly see the BRICS as a transitional form between the traditional approach to institutions embodied by the Western-oriented institutions and new forms of cooperation that will emerge in the future. The BRICS countries have been facing thus, when we speak about countering their terrorism, have been facing twofold goal. How to accommodate their national approaches with the global views and global agenda on this particular field, as embodied by the several United Nations resolutions, and find the, these questions and topics on which they really find a minimum of disagreement among them, taking into consideration their more, most urgent national priorities. I would actually a little bit disagree with our, uh, with our moderator, who said in the beginning that fighting the terrorism is a goal of the international community. Well, first, I should stress that defining the terrorism is the goal of the national states, since the states are only responsible bodies in front of their citizens. But it does not, saying that, it does not exclude that the states can cooperate uh, on even such a difficult issue, or such a problematic issue. And it must be said that the BRICS countries have been going for a long time to the issue of cooperation in the insensitive area. For example, the Greeks Working Group on Counterterrorism held its first meeting in September 2016 under India's presidency, 10 years after the group was established among Brazil, China, India, and Russia, and five years after South Africa joined the group. However, during the last year and during the Russian presidency, the BRICS countries have been so successful to adapt their common, common counterterrorism strategy which was originally initiated by, in 2017 by the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi when he proposed the adoption of the BRICS counterterrorism strategy to give impetus to counterterrorism cooperation between BRICS countries. So, in, on, September, on November 17, 2020, the BRICS summit, Moscow heard virtually, of course, adopted the BRICS counterterrorism strategy, which has enlisted the goals the principles and the priorities of the participating countries in this very sensitive field. And taking into consideration the generally poor condition of the international cooperation nowadays, I think it should be considered as a big achievement. So thus, now the BRICS countries can boast of having a common framework document on such a sensitive issue. We do not know, however, what the sequel will be. However, it can be assumed that the BRICS countries should take these goals and principles in the form of the common view. This will allow in the future to develop flexible cooperation with each other and with the third states. The main experience that the past historical period teaches us is that international institutions should not strive for secrecy and set goals that fully meet only some of their participants. I think that the BRICS group is very well prepared for this approach, which looks very promising under current circumstances. So thank you very much, my colleagues, and I'm very much looking forward to your intervention and our possible discussion with this, this academic forum, so brilliantly organized by our colleagues and friends from Observer Foundation and Indian Presidency. Thank you. Very relevant points being made there. Uh, let's go straight uh, to the third speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Shen Yi from Fudan University, China. Uh, my great pleasure. Uh, dear colleagues, it's my great honor to have the opportunities to participate in these sessions. 
I think it's a very interesting and very important topics to talk about how to launch kind of consensus understandings on these terrain issues and how to find out whether we can form a kind of BRICS uh, common policies in dealing with these issues. I have three points. The first, it's quite clear. Uh, the terrorism is kind of global threat, which need to be deal with in a common framework and the ground so that we can make better understandings and proper solutions to solve these issues. Uh, since the 2001 September 11th attack, the new trends of so-called global terrorism already, already become one of the most important issues of global governance. The United States has already introduced the military approaches to counter terrorism, and after more than 10 of the years, we find it's not a very efficient way. And nowadays, we face more terrorism threat in certain situations, for example, in Afghanistan rather than other countries, how to deal with this issue properly, and how to deal with this global uh, new threat in the framework of global governance, which we can, how to say, mitigate or even terminate the, the real root and the real driving force to bring birth of the new terrorism is very important. And the second, British countries comparing to United States or other Western countries has quite different understanding of this global interest. Maybe it's the hope and the better opportunity, a kind of strategic opportunities for BRICS countries finding a new mechanisms, how these terror issues become burst and how to count it effectively, not only depending on those military approaches, but also try to solve those roots of those earths that help the birth and the development of these terrible issues. And the third, I think to BRICS countries, talking about the issue like countering the threat of terrorism is very important uh, providence to, uh, yes, to prove the development of the uh, integrations and the cooperations among BRICS countries. At the very beginning, this BRICS turn mainly focusing on the economic issues, trade issues, investment and financial issues. Now the BRICS countries are already exploring and trying to develop their cooperations from those economic issues to security issues and to the governance issues. It will be very important to providing the new contributions, more effective contribution, represent the common understanding requirement from the developing and the newly emerging countries in the world in a general ways. I think that's very important for the world contributions to counter the common threat raised by this terrorism in general ways. Okay, thank you very much. We're waiting to uh, hear uh, comments from others on uh, the points that all of you have made. Uh, let me quickly also go to Professor Nirmala Gopal, uh, who's joining us from South Africa today to make her opening comments. Professor Gopal, I'm going to request you to unmute yourself, please. Apologies. Thank you very much, moderator. And uh, good morning to my colleague in Brazil and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow panelists. It is my singular honor to rejoin my esteemed peers in sharing data on a really critical narrative, namely countering terrorism, as our moderator and our previous speakers have already mentioned. We have already this afternoon heard the many discourses on terrorism and its inherent DNA to evoke emotional feelings during debates on the phenomenon. This is, of course, not an unusual response by any stretch of the imagination. Terrorism and its associated nefarious activities are cruel in and of itself. Nonetheless, we as uh, BRICS realize and regard this as a critical debate insofar as establishing ourselves a robust player in counter-terrorism. Now, unlike my peer from, from Russia, I move from the premise that as a, uh, as a grouping, we, we have a shared understanding of what we want to achieve in terms of countering terrorism. So in yesterday's inaugural session, we heard that BRICS constitutes almost or over 50% of the global population. 
So what does this mean for us? It means that we have a large cohort whose security welfare we must protect in the interest of growth and development in the current world order. So perusal of existing literature, credible opinion pieces, and multiple digital and non-digital media sources have categorically demonstrated the menacing nature of terrorism with malicious disruptive capabilities, which my peers have also already alluded to. We also understand through readings, through uh, experiences, etc., that these capabilities potentially can debilitate an entire nat nation's normative status quo. However, with, and someone has rightfully pointed out, with our encyclopedia of a decade of declarations, and I looked at the declarations between 2010 and 2020, BRICS has articulated our comprehension of the impact of terrorist activities on our aggregated sociopolitical milieu and our vehement repudiation of terrorist activities. So we capture all of this in the 2020 counterterrorism strategy. The crafting, the crafting of the strategy is an excellent blueprint, in my view, for designing our counterterrorism initiatives. So again, I use the, the fact that we have a, a, a strategy uh, to, um, to translate into the fact that we will cooperate with each other. However, operationalizing our initiative sooner rather than later is key to evaluating the success of us of the strategy. So my, uh, my standpoint or my worldview is that our collective wisdom and intelligence capabilities remind us that all accounting terrorism, countering terrorism is a daunting task. It is nonetheless non-negotiable. Our initiatives must ensure full coordination amongst BRICS and with state and non-state actors. And I'm sure all of us sitting here and who have researched and are researching this, uh, the, um, uh, the narrative on terrorism will understand that your, non, your state and non-state actors are critical in terms of countering terrorism. So at this point in time, I propose a school of thought using a socio-political lens in understanding the root causes of terrorism, the why, the what, and the how. I think in practice, we should use existing data as part of our BRIC strategy. I use existing data sources and as many digital platforms as possible to generate useful data to answer the critical questions of the why, the what, and how of terrorism. I think in addition, we should interrogate terrorist organizations' aims, objectives, and visions at a very microscopic level for our responses to yield positive outcomes. Additionally, our thorough comprehension of the root causes of terrorism will undoubtedly facilitate implementing our own, which is BRICS Counterterrorism 2020 strategy. However, I, I believe our work will be incomplete unless we initiate the following. Consider the nature and extent of the internet as a recruitment tool. Um, but at this point, and I think that is at the moment, the internet as a recruitment tool is playing a really large and critical role in, a role in terms of recruitment, in terms of radicalization, of especially our youth. And at this point, I want to spend my last two concluding minutes to focus on the importance of youth in countering terrorism. It is undoubtedly hypercritical uh, hyper for, for BRICS to accentuate the role of our youth in, achi in achieving peace and security. This role is already acknowledged by the international development community. Um, specifically through the United Nations Security Council resolutions 2250 and 2419. These, recogni these resolutions recognize that young people can be agents of change in promoting peace and security and anti-radicalization. Further, these resolutions 
give impetus to BRICS to call for greater youth participation and create youth opportunities for meaningful engagement. And I say this within the context of the vulnerability and sometimes discontentment of youth. And these, the discontentment and their own vulnerabilities usually make them fertile candidates for extremism and radicalization. And this is part of, where, part of how the um, terrorist organizations actually do their recruitment. So understanding the behavior of our youth, I think, is critical. And hence, including youth in decision-making structures and engaging them meaningfully in political dialogue guarantees them that their voices will be heard. So we don't, we shouldn't marginalize or exclude them from mainstream discourses. Most critically in conclusion, I believe that we as BRICS should invest in our, in our youth for the sake of peace, stability, and economic growth and development. Let us steer them away from being recruited for malicious intent. We should own as BRICS the new narrative, say no to terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gopal. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's now go to Professor Sriram Cholia for his opening comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Palki. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of problems which I think uh, BRICS collectively at the political level, at the top leadership uh, and governmental level, but also us academics should be uh, 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 approaching and, and trying to redress. The first, of course, has been hinted by our colleagues uh, uh, from all the member countries who have spoken so far, which is a kind of geographical dissonance of BRICS. The fact that we all, uh, you know, uh, inhabit different sub-regions of the world, Africa, Latin America, Eurasia, uh, means that our um, uh, realities are different in terms of security threats, in terms of uh, national security perceptions, and in terms of the uh, actors, armed actors and lethal uh, threats to nation states and to societies. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, Brazil is, of course, an outlier, like our colleague was mentioning. Uh, in Latin America, um, the only known terrorist groups were the ones who came out of Colombia during the uh, long civil war, you know, and they were operating across borders. Uh, and But they were not, uh, they were very localized in the sense they didn't have a footprint in other parts of the world. Sometimes, uh, you know, Middle East based groups like Hezbollah were mentioned to be operating um, in, in, in Argentina and carrying out attacks against Israeli institutions. But frankly, uh, the region has not experienced the kind of threat that uh, you are seeing, that we have seen a lot in Eurasia, which concerns ma mainly uh, Russia, India, and China. Um, and uh, to a lesser extent now in Southern Africa, we are seeing the uh, so-called ISIS phenomenon now arising in Mozambique, right next door to South Africa. And there's been a lot of interest in what's happening in uh, up north uh, in northern Mozambique on the border with Tanzania uh, in Cabo Delgado. Um, so uh, this, as far as the jihadist kind of terrorism is concerned, um, it's less of a concern uh, for Africa and I think probably very minimal concern for Latin America. But on the other hand, for us in um, India, China and Russia, it's right up there, you know, it's, it's the uh, main focus of our uh, entire state establishments and the main concern of our societies uh, who worry about um, fundamentalist uh, Islam becoming uh, weaponized to carry out uh, violent acts. Uh, so um, in that sense, how can BRICS then as a group um, work on this um, problem of geographical dissonance? I think we have to actually, uh, my view is, BRICS must uh, designate, uh, obviously, each of us come from these different sub-regions, and we should be taking the lead in our respective regions with BRICS backing it, you know, a kind of like a BRICS endorsed regionalized approaches to uh, countering terrorism in every sub-sub-sub-sub-region uh, 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 sub of the world. So, for example, if, the, if there is suddenly this new force in, in uh, Mozambique, um, uh, then there is a reason for us to all to defer to South Africa and South African intelligence, South African military and uh, South African think tanks, academics uh, should be uh, taking the lead because they have the localized area knowledge, while the others 
should uh, follow that lead and we should all be supporting not just uh, with whatever information and intelligence that we have to share that we may have access to about these groups but also uh, things like uh, tactics you know SWAT tactics of police uh, uh, anti-terrorism squads uh, prevention mitigation bomb detection there are lots of things on which you know um, law enforcement a uh, prosecution, a lot of information that uh, experience that uh, we in Eurasia have, which probably is not uh, as strong in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis terrorism, um, or uh, certainly not uh, in Latin America. So I think we should be doing such things. We, if Afghanistan has already been mentioned by our Russian colleague, there's no question that it's common for Russia, India, and China. Uh, in fact, the onus is on us to try and, um, you know, uh, douse this fire, this big fire that's burning there. And um, increasingly in this, what I call a post-American world, uh, we need to take the onus and BRICS, I think, should then, um, the other rest of the countries which have not got a direct stake in Afghanistan should uh, indirectly support the lead countries in that region. So that's the first problem and potential solution. The second problem is um, geopolitics versus counterterrorism. You know, this is also a kind of a fault line that generally the joint statements and the communiques that come out of BRICS summits, they try to paper over. But behind the scenes, you know, the haggling goes on and we know that this is often a problem. Now, I'll give you one example. 2017 BRICS summit, Xiamen in China, uh, there was a very famous declaration on counterterrorism in which a lot of um, hardline jihadist groups were named specifically for the first time as a serious concern and that which must be neutralized and countered. And a lot of these uh, groups that were mentioned were based in Pakistan. Uh, Lashkar-e-Tayyaba, jaish e um, e taliban Pakistan, Hizbut Tahrir. These are dangerous groups, uh, but not so much again for South Africa or, or Brazil, but definitely in, in this sub-region. Um, and uh, uh, the, the big news was, of course, that China uh, went along with this, even though China has a very tight, uh, you know, strategic alliance, uh, 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 all, all weather alliance with Pakistan. So it was seen as a shift in the BRICS context, because earlier China was seen as hesitant to be putting Pakistan on the mat or to embarrass Pakistan um, through such uh, joint uh, multilateral uh, events. Nonetheless, China did it and was much appreciated by all of us. And, you know, uh, but what has happened is parallel to that, China continued to maintain uh, what was called a technical hold at the UN on uh, proscribing the leader of one of these hardline uh, jihadist groups in Pakistan, Jaish e Mohammed, whose name is Masood Azhar. So to get him to be proscribed was, it took, uh, you know, several more years. It was only in May 2020 or so that the lift the the hold was lifted everybody agreed in the un uh, and in um, uh, for this to happen right so ideally speaking the brics cooperation should have yielded this much earlier but it didn't because there is a strategic alliance uh, between pakistan and china which is to actually contain india so uh, and to and to maintain chinese uh, uh, power and influence in the region so there are these problems uh, that crop up from time to time we often have this debate around brics saying, um, well, there are lots of joint statements, common, um, you know, platitudes that we utter on paper. There's a lot of, you know, ink that we sign on to, but then um, the, is there enough walking of the talk or not? But I think uh, increasingly with the uh, externalities coming out of Afghanistan, I think all five of us, I dare say even Africa and Latin America, could be um, uh, severely impacted by this inferno. And um, I think the sooner we realize that there, there is, you know, no, no such thing as a good terrorist or a bad terrorist, we are all better off. And of course, it's a lot harder to uh, achieve this because states weigh competing priorities when they uh, make uh, strategies, even in forums like BRICS, right? Um, our Russian colleague was talking about this, that there are national level uh, objectives and strategies. And sometimes uh, perhaps a BRICS agreement is less important than, um, you know, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, to, to, to put it in a very crude manner, countries weigh costs and benefits. And uh, sometimes countering terrorism may not be as um, uh, advantageous, seen as, as advantageous by national elites of certain countries 
uh, as uh, um, uh, maintaining alliances. So um, I think the how do we overcome this? I think it can only be overcome. One is the empirical reality. Like for example, recently we are seeing lots of attacks against Chinese personnel in China. Uh, sorry, in Pakistan uh, and uh, uh, from across the border in Afghanistan. So I think the sooner the RIC is in a many ways the fulcrum of the counterterrorism uh, uh, function in BRICS because RIC, Russia, India, China, uh, if we are together and if we are coordinated, I think we have a greater chance of success. Uh, South Africa and Latin, uh, sorry, Africa and Latin America will need greater support from us because we are more experienced. We have, we have been bigger victims. We've had lots and lots of casualties uh, from terrorism. And therefore, we have much more to share with the rest of them and to take them along. So it's very important, I think, that there is a RIC mechanism also, as you know, separate ministerials uh, happen from time to time, Russia, India, and China. The closer we can coordinate the three of us, I think uh, we can really make the dream of BRICS as like a transcontinental uh, counterterrorism cooperation a reality. Thank you. Very well put. Uh, so I've we we have taken notes from all uh, all the points that have been made here and i can say i agree with uh, uh, with uh, uh, dr bodachev when he said that this pandemic has shown uh, that that international institutions uh, have failed to to uh, live up to expectations uh, and and the rise of national agendas has certainly played a role uh, afghanistan is proof of uh, of a situation where you may not have act actively participated in the shaping of a situation and yet you will be uh, at the at the receiving end of, of the fallout and the third thing that that we've all seem to agree with is that there are national priorities there are BRICS priorities there are international priorities and then there are priorities of your partners and allies and and geopolitical friends so how do you balance all of it and say that this is what is a common threat and this is not how do you define and all of that. These are the challenges. Uh, the questions from the audience have already started coming in, so I'll go straight to, uh, with those. Uh, if given an option, should BRICS focus more on de-radicalization or on prevention of radicalization in the first place? Uh, uh, let's go with. Let's let's take this question with Anna Cruz first, Professor Cruz. That preventing uh, the damage is always better than trying to fix it. And there are few successful experiences as far as I know. So there are few guarantees of de-radicalizing individuals. And so, and there's a, a very same question below asking about if building peace is better than reactive measures. So I think it's, it's, it's very similar to those questions. And it's the same answer for me. Yes, job creation, human rights, building a pact for mutual trust and mutual help would be better, in my opinion. Professor Gopal, is job creation the key then? Yes, thank you, um, Paki. I, I, I strongly believe that job creation is one of the key determinants in reducing um, in reducing discontentment, and I think when we look at literature that that seeks to understand how and why the young people um, join these organizations, it's usually, you know, it's oftentimes you, young people who don't have, who are unemployed, who, who are not meaningfully occupied. So I think job creation is key. Dr. Baldajev, do you agree? And and uh, when we answer these questions and take these questions on whether job creation is the is is the answer to this, uh, we sometimes overlook the fact that terrorism is also, uh, in some cases, used as an instrument of of, of pushing a certain political policy. Um, is it as simple as not having a job and not having enough to do, so you you go down uh, the wrong? Road? Yes, indeed, I absolutely agree with you, dear moderator. And, uh, well, first of all, I mean, the, the very existence of BRICS is about prevention of radicalization, because a significant part of BRICS agenda is about the economic development and is about the mutual openness and establishing the economic connections and uh, eventually better incorporation of the BRICS countries into the global economy. So it is about the prevention of, of the radical movements and radical behavior 
by the economic development and by the increasing the quality of life of the ordinary citizens. However, we cannot say that the job creation is a panacea. So example is China. The Chinese government did a lot in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous District to make jobs, to bring money in. Though the powers of nationalism, though might be irrational from the, from the economic point of view, very often contradict the, uh, actually the efforts done by the governments in order to improve the economic quality of life. I have been traveling to Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous District a couple of years ago, and uh, I had a chance to compare the quality of life people before that and after. And I can assure you that the Chinese government does a lot to, and did a lot, to improve the quality of life and to make jobs before, before it faced some, some complexities related to the ethnic and religious, religious uh, nationalism. So it's not always, it's, one, it's part of the answer, but it's not only one answer, it's not only one working answer. So we should we should think wider in this sense, and uh, the, the the question is what about uh, the peace building and what about uh, the cooperation cooperation in this field? I think that the BRICS countries do a lot to 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 offer the international community the better ways of setting their international and internal disputes especially with a reference to the United Nations and the role of United Nations. So I think that in this sense, BRICS contributes as well. Dr. Shania, do you want to comment on this? I think this question is a little bit complicated, but uh, there are three things It's very clear. The first, just the experience we're learning from the Cold War, that the one side terrorism is the other side free fighters. That's the issues, or that's the kind of situation we must avoid, which means we should not allow any guys to take advantage of these terrorism actions or these terrorism groups as kind of either agents or send tools for so-called geopolitical interest, which means that may, that will make kind of legitimize or double or triple standard to dealing with these terrorism issues, the first. And the second, we need building a kind of ecosystems to governance to deal with this terrorism more thoroughly. Uh, just uh, like the professor from Russia side already mentioned, uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, to trigger those terrorism issues. But one of the important thing is you need to solve the question why so many people or why such kind of people will support, will become the member, will join this non-discrimination violation actions or the groups. So you need to providing them more efficiency issues to dealing with, to solving their requirements in Iraq or in Afghanistan. It's quite clear if you want to counter in the Al Qaeda or those local terrorism, uh, ISIRs, you need to providing the public goods, sustainable uh, water, electronic suppliers, to local peoples so that you can providing them a common, quite safe environment to live in with so that you cut off their support for the terrorist groups. And the third, I think tolerance, coordinations, and a common understanding among different countries, for example, among BRICS member states is very important. I just uh, find out the Shaman declarations, you will find that during those articles talking about the terrorists, talking about their concern about the violence triggered by the, the, the terrorism groups, there's a lot of common understandings which will multiple cover each other's core interest and respect each other's core interest so that we can coexistence, finding our common ground, even though the existence of the difference. So I think that's very important. Uh, Professor Jolia, if we were to talk about uh, technology, uh, use of technology in curbing uh, uh, terrorism, uh, almost a decade ago, the United Nations uh, 
uh, warned the world about this, saying that the world lacks universal instruments to address terrorist activities online better. How can uh, BRICS collaborate on the use of technology to counter terrorism? Yeah, internet radicalization is a big phenomenon, Palki. We know it. Uh, there is a, a lot of these lone wolf attackers also who don't necessarily have a huge uh, social base, but who uh, sitting in some basement somewhere can you know, access uh, propaganda videos of ISIS or Al-Qaeda or uh, Al-Shabaab or other groups uh, uh, or Jaish-e Mohammed and they could, uh, you know, uh, easily organize, uh, they turn themselves into um, uh, a minor weapon of, of mass destruction. So uh, internet radicalization, obviously, we have to censor uh, content that uh, deliberately incites people to hatred against certain religious communities or against uh, even a whole country, or uh, which also uh, presents uh, myopic, uh, you know, pictures of uh, alleged human rights abuses by state authorities. I mean, state authorities do commit uh, uh, abuses in counterinsurgency and so on, but often the propaganda is such that uh, it is taken out of context and to make it look like there is some genocide going on, you know, and then it becomes a basis to mobilize uh, people, uh, young people, the youth, our uh, uh, friend from South Africa was talking about, um, you're already hopeless or feeling politically uh, marginalized in your own uh, respective communities. Then there is this, you know, cause. I mean, just recall the ISIS is not over. It just started like seven, eight years ago. And fighters from more than 120 countries uh, last uh, counted uh, had showed up in uh, to fight in Syria at the call of a so-called uh, caliphate. So imagine there were youth and many from our own countries, you know, uh, from our own uh, uh, the uh, BRICS member countries. So uh, the point is that there is radicalization using the internet and uh, reasonable checks and controls must be exercised. I think the idea of the free speech and the idea of, uh, you know, uh, that a, a non-interventionist state frankly will not work in these cases we need to be harder we have to take a harder line uh, of course it cannot uh, uh, in especially in the democratic member countries of brics we cannot override our uh, you know constitutional checks and balances but the point i'm try trying to say is that um, you know there has to be greater state intervention and of course neighborhoods we need to also have neighborhood level you know policing self policing by communities we need to have uh, not just informants in communities, but also uh, elders uh, uh, who uh, actually counsel these young people uh, to help them to get out of this addiction. There are lots of them sitting online to, uh, 18 to 20 hours a day and yeah. just watching these videos and then preparing um, for violence. So I think uh, they need to be checked and uh, through stricter monitoring. And I think we have to also share um, tracking tools, you know, online behavior has to be tracked. I mean, if 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 you're not doing anything violent, you shouldn't have anything to fear. But the point I'm trying to say is some of these civil liberties um, have to be uh, kept aside when we know there is a cluster or when there is a problem in a particular region or locality, we need to pinpoint and, and go down there and actually control internet activity. I think that's the only way to prevent uh, active uh, live terrorist uh, uh, incidents. That's a, that's a full-fledged debate on its own. Now, what do we do with civil liberties? Uh, let me take this question with uh, Dr. Borzichev. You mentioned Afghanistan. With the Taliban's offensive in Afghanistan, we know that whatever is happening there, there's a real threat of this violence spin to the neighborhood. Um, three BRICS members have a direct stake in Afghanistan, and they can't seem to agree on the way forward. Uh, and that this is just one example. Do you think that uh, BRICS members, or any multilateral organization for that matter, uh, can find a way uh, to agree on larger issues like la radicalization and terrorism and how to deal with them? Well, I think that uh, for the moment, the Russian government position is very clear. We, uh, Russia will object any, uh, any extremist attempts to extend the intra-Afghanistani problems to the neighboring territories, especially to the territories of Russia's friends and allies in Central Asia. So the position is non-interventionist, and but at the same time very clear in terms of uh, our obligations regarding uh, regarding Central Asian countries. 
Well, uh, as far as I remember from the intervention of the Russian foreign minister during the Tashkent conference on international cooperation in Central and Southern Asia two weeks ago, where the Indian Minister of Foreign Affairs was also present, uh, this the approach that uh, the internal settlement in Afghanistan should be the business of Afghani people is assured among the BRICS countries, even though, as the Indian colleague underlined very correctly, uh, there is a problem of Pakistan, which has a particular connection and particular influence on the internal situation in Afghanistan. Dr. Shani, with uh, some fundamental differences in approach, do you believe BRICS countries can effectively work together to come up with a mechanism to counter terrorism? Yeah, I think that to the BRICS countries, we can provide a uh, very effective uh, how to say, development for those approaches. We already have these counter-terrorism. We can launch the security borders, but also we can help those countries suffering from the terrorism issues to develop, to make a proper development of their own, including economics, which means providing more effective internal uh, development of their economies to ensure them have a more s sustainable uh, development of their social lives and so on, which will decrease the potential support for any extreme of use of the violisms. For those people who want to have a better lives, we, the BRICS countries can work in together to help them to doing these things. Just professor from Russia side already mentioned on these Afghanistan issues, take examples. The general understanding from the BRICS countries is this Afghanistan issues should be solved by the Afghan people themselves. We should not intervention them too much. And we just treat them like a normal countries and we providing them necessary assistance to help them to have a more healthier and safer lives. And then to prevent any overfill of this potential and possibility of these terrorism to any nearby countries. That's our means. So that's the also the difference ways that counter terrorism if comparing the BRICS ways and the United States ways to dealing with these issues. Thank you. Uh, Professor Anna Cruz, in 2019, Brazilian President uh, uh, Bolsonaro said terrorism is one of the priority areas for BRICS. And now the BRICS counter-terrorism action plan is one of the key deliverables during India's uh, chairmanship of BRICS this year. What sort of tangibles uh, should we be looking at when we say that we're working towards counter-terrorism? Sorry, Pauke, I lost the, the, few, the few last words that you asked. Um, I'm saying when we work, when we say that we have set uh, a counterterrorism action plan as a key deliverable, what sort of tangible goal should we be setting for ourselves? Well, I believe that there are, starting from the beginning, uh, we were looking for consensus and it's very difficult. We all know that global consensus on definition of terrorism is very difficult. But we may certainly, it's a viable option to work together to join efforts in capacitations and exchanging information and tightening cooperation so we can go further in this, in this mutual trust and cooperation. I think that this is the immediate goal that we must uh, aim to tighten in cooperation and tighten in mutual trust so we can move forward. Professor Gopal, your thoughts on this? Uh, what sort of measurable goals should be set in this effort? Professor Gopal, please unmute yourself. Right, we have two minutes left. No, you're not audible. I know you're talking. <laughs> no voice. Right. Okay, I, I think I'll wrap it in, in, in any case because uh, 
we have a minute left if uh, if if one of you wants to wants to make a closing comment you're more than welcome to do that i think you've all said what needs to be said i think uh, there's a lot to be done uh, and everyone agrees that that we need to come up with a common uh, understanding a shared understanding of what terrorism is and how to deal with it uh, uh, but but you're welcome to make a, a closing comment uh, a palki can i yes well uh, to sum up you know the thing is uh, the brics has a variety of uh, issue areas under its consideration and the security pillar peace and security pillar generally has not been as strong as the economic cooperation and uh, you know development bank and uh, you know con contingency reserve arrangement so on there is a national security advisor uh, meeting that we have been having of a brics country since 2009 and i think uh, under that through that rubric only now we have reached this point of counter uh, terrorism working groups and sub working groups mechanisms are good but i i think we should also do something as i said identify hot spots and crisis zones in our respective neighborhoods and uh, make a joint effort and a sh uh, joint show of force uh, both diplomatic uh, and through other means so that we can resolve some of these uh, armed conflicts because often they the spillover of these armed conflicts leads to this terrorism so i think uh, brics needs to uh, uh, pick projects for counter terrorism uh, mechanisms sub mechanisms working groups we got lots and lots of formal yeah. processes and institutions but let's do some projects let's i think pick afghanistan there's no bigger cause right now yes uh and i'd like to see the glass half full but i'd say it's easier said than done but it was a pleasure listening to all of you and uh, and we do hope that the next time we meet and have a discussion uh, we can share notes and say this is what has been achieved and this is the way forward thank you very much ladies and